Welcome back to another edition of the Heart to Heart podcast. And my guest today is Eva Chekyuk. She's a Canadian lawyer. She also cross-examined Justin Trudeau. So Eva, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. So there's a lot of different reasons why I want to chat with you today. I've been following you on Twitter for a long time. There's actually been a lot of recent news as well that I want to chat with you about, especially about the, uh, the 173 million going into the vaccines. And, you know, we don't really know where that money is uh, is going or if they even produce any vaccines from that facility. So there's a lot of things going on. But, you know, where I wanted to, to start, uh, I'm sure, you know, all your podcasts start this way, but, you know, cross-examining Justin Trudeau. So, you know, that's a, that's a really big deal. So how did you come to uh, cross-examine Justin Trudeau? Well, you know, it's really interesting because I was involved from really early on with um, representing some of the more pertinent and well-known protesters in the Freedom Convoy in Ottawa. Um, I was in the middle of it in Ottawa, um, but nobody knew who I was, which was fine. It was actually nice to be in the background and lots of heat, lots of attention. And I don't think we've ever seen a more divisive issue in Canada than with the vaccines and then the protest. So um, I was very involved. I was legal counsel for, like I said, some of the more prominent members. Um, and then as soon as they invoked the Emergencies Act on February 14th, we knew that there would be this inquiry into whether or not the federal government's uh, actions were justified. And it had to be done in a very short period of time. So we knew that we were preparing for it um, over the summer. Um, but Keith Wilson and I, who were both quite involved in all of this, recognized that, uh, number one, this is a lot more than we could manage. But number two, and I guess more importantly, is that we were very involved with the day to day on the ground in Ottawa. And we were told that we might be witnesses at the inquiry. So we made ourselves available or we changed our role to being solicitors which in Canada, usually there's there's not a distinction like that. Like, for example, your lawyer can go to court and argue, and also he could draft a contract and a real estate agreement for you. Um, in the UK, it's different. You usually are either behind the scenes or up in court. So we we split things that way just because of our knowledge. So I was number one in Ottawa, involved in negotiations with the city of Ottawa and being on the ground. So seeing for myself what was going on, I was at the Public Order Emergencies Commission inquiry for six weeks, helping manage and mid, uh, manage the background of the case. And then we got to the last day of the cross-examinations and uh, our clients had asked us to change course on how we're going to cross-examine the Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, we had all of the evidentiary information and record we we needed to show that the Emergencies Act was not justified. None of the police officers or um, officials said that they needed it or they requested it. So we were in a good good position there. And what we wanted, what our clients wanted to, is to for for the questions to Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, to come from the voice of Canadians, the Canadians that he didn't listen to, that he disparaged, um, that he did not bother to come out and um, address. And so we wanted to bring a different voice. And in the end, it was um, decided that I would be the one asking those questions. And I think because I was so involved, it did help because I had an opportunity to hear stories from people. And that was actually part of my job during the commission is I was gathering stories for the commission because we didn't know if we could bring more witnesses or not. So despite everything that you've done, do you still feel though, like he kind of just got away with it? Got away with what? Like got away with imposing the Emergencies Act and then there was no repercussions for that, despite the fact that you've been able to prove that, you know, all these police officers didn't try to invoke these acts. It was just that something that he did on his own. Like, do you feel like he kind of got away with that? So great question. And this is something, you know, we've been trying to bring to light and help inform. And this is a reason I enjoy doing these things because there's, Turns out law and politics is not very, very easy to understand. And there's a lot going on. So with the commission, 
It was a fact-finding exercise. The report at the end of the day had no legal bearing, had no uh, teeth in court. Like you couldn't do anything with it. And when people were asking us all the time before, like, this is going to be a whitewash, it's his uncle, we're like, okay, maybe, we don't know. But what we encouraged everyone to do is watch it and hear the evidence for themselves. So then they can make their own informed decision about whether or not it's a whitewash. But people wanted Justin Trudeau to go to jail. They wanted the this and that. And we knew going in that wasn't the case. Of note, there is a federal court challenge still that there is no decision on it. So a number of people um, applied to the federal court and asked the federal court to decide whether or not the federal government overstepped um, with the invoking the Emergencies Act. That will have legal bearing. That decision we don't have yet. Okay. Because right now it does seem like, you know, he imposed the Emergencies Act without you know, the proper authorization and there's, you know, essentially been no severe consequences for it so far. So it's good to know that, you know, there's still an ongoing case going on and that, you know, we may in fact have a different verdict later on. Um, in terms of like, you know, cross-examining Justin Trudeau himself, like, did you get any sense that he had any remorse by doing this decision? Did you get just a sense that this was something that he did? He's proud that he did it and he wants to continue to show Canadians that this was the right decision. Yeah, it you know, I, I, I can't really tell more than what people saw. That, and again, that was one of the reasons it was good for people to watch it. You see his reactions just as much as I did, although I was a little bit closer in, in real life. But um, one thing going into the commission, too, it, it was going to be a very difficult, I think, process for anyone to say, OK, he really screwed up here because then what's going to happen? Really? And there was no way he was going to say, you're right, everyone. I, I invoke I shouldn't have done it. He had to hold his position and his stance, there was no way he was going to say anything else. So what we had decided to do is make it more about the questions. Again, to hear the voice, we knew he would come back with political responses and talking points because that's what he's trained to do. And so um, we didn't expect anything more than that. You know, there maybe there were a few times that he he heard things he didn't want to finally because he I think he's able to shut things out. Um, you know, he's not a regular Canadian by any stretch. So maybe this was an opportunity to, that he actually heard it. Maybe he'll feel remorse at some point, but I don't know if that happened right there and then. Okay. Yeah. I uh, Well, thank you again for, you know, cross-examining him. I think a lot of the Canadians would like, you know, some justice to be brought for what he's done. You know, because he did, again, invoke an emergencies act from what we understand without uh, the proper authorization use. And there's been no consequences for it. So very interesting to see how that story unfolds. But just in general, too, like, you know, through the, the, the cross-examination, did you just kind of get a sense that there's just a lot of, like, theater overall in politics and the House of Commons in Canada? Just because, like, when you look at a lot of these videos and stuff online you see these clips like it's kind of like what you just were talking about it's like you present this hard evidence to someone you can show that you know something wrong has been done or maybe something right's been done and then the person then who's who's questions you know justin trudeau in this case he just sort of seems to give these political answers and then there's no actually you know bearing to the evidence that's in presented it kind of seems like it would be infuriating for the people who are trying to you know, cross-examine him or trying to get some kind of response from him. Yeah, and I, I would kind of throw that back to you too. Like, do you think that, that it's theater? And the other question is, is that acceptable? Is is that what Canadians should be expecting and agreeing with their elected officials to be doing so? I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, like, I just can't watch any of the House of Commons stuff. It just seems to be back and forth banter where someone asks a question and the question just doesn't get answered. Then they re-ask the question again, maybe in a, a better manner or a, a, a more you know precise manner. And then for whatever reason, you know, the people still can't answer and the question just gets just gets asked again. Like, it just seems like it's like 
this back and forth nonsensical dialogue where like nothing actually gets sorted out. And we're paying for it. So this is where I'm trying to change the conversation in Canada is if we don't believe that's acceptable behavior and responses and behavior by these elected officials, what are we doing to demand change? Because it's, I'm, I agree, it's getting pretty ridiculous. I, a few times I've noted that um, the, the action, the behavior between elected officials sometimes is like children in a schoolyard. And then I thought about it and I'm like, I think actually children in a schoolyard behave more appropriately. And I think that it's, and this is again, I'm trying to change the conversation. We have to stop waiting for other people to come and resolve and, and fix things. We have to take ownership of these issues. And if we see our elected officials acting like children or misbehaving and not responding to questions that we agree with, we need to do something about it. Yeah. And, and I won't harp on it too, too much further, but it's just like, I remember there was a time when Pierre Polyev was asking, you know, Trudeau or someone in the liberal cabinet, you know, how much money was spent uh, on, I'm not sure it was with healthcare or, you know, the military or whatever it was. And they just couldn't give them a number. And he said, can you just give me a number? I don't know how many times he asked the question it must've been close to half a dozen times. And he just would not give him a number. And it's just so infuriating as a Canadian to watch that. And so, you know, that's why, I, you know, like for myself, I've just sort of at a point now where it's not worth my time for me to watch something like that. Like, I'm not just going to watch someone ask the same question over and over over and then get no response. So it's funny you mentioned that one because I'm pretty sure that clip is him asking MP Randy Boissonneau, who happens to be um, my MP. And okay. when I saw that clip, I wrote to my MP in uh, February, I think it was, or March of 2022, being like, these are reasonable, legitimate questions being asked. And as my elected official, I think that you should be answering it. It was about, I believe, um, monthly, the rent, how much it's changed, how much rent is um, somewhere in Canada. And he kept deflecting. But I took the time to write to my member of parliament and say, I don't think your behavior was appropriate. I put to you how many other Canadians took the time to do the same thing. And again, it's a shift that we need, I think, in Canada to start making. We can turn it off, but then should we be complaining about it? Yeah, I, uh, I, I think that Canadians definitely deserve better. And I really you know, hope that the House of Commons sort of gets sorted out so that it's actually a productive place instead of people just kind of creating theater for you know, no reason. That's not helping us at all. And like you said earlier, it's also a waste of taxpayer dollars as well. This issue, it's really interesting what happened uh, just yesterday or today with, with Tucker Carlson. Um, so, you know, I like Tucker. I understand some people don't like Tucker, but, you know, like he, he's, he's had some great interviews. Um, you know, there's lots of things that I certainly agree with. Uh, about Tucker. And I think he's done a great job in, you know, exposing some things that should be uh, exposed over the last few years. He's done some, you know, good reporting. And I understand that now he wants to interview Danielle Smith. And there's a lot of people who are very upset about that. And I guess one lady who's very upset is, uh, I'm probably not going to say her name right, Rachel Notley, and she would be yeah. the NDP leader in BC, correct? So, um, Oh, sorry, Alberta. And so what's what's going on there? Like, why is Rachel so upset about this? I'm sure. It, I, I don't understand it either, except for attention that she's receiving. Um, yeah. You know, I think it's divide and conquer tactics. And the other thing I've noticed with at least the NDP party in Alberta, and I just commented on it the other day, is the constant alarmist and fear tactics. And to me, it's it's really annoying for me, but I find it concerning when they're doing it to vulnerable people. And I don't like that. I That's so irresponsible of an elected official. I actually sat in on, um, well, I wanted to participate. I wanted to learn about the, I, I think you've heard about the Alberta pension plan proposal 
to cut leave the Canadian pension plan. So I didn't know much about the subject and I saw the NDP in Alberta was hosting a town hall. So I attended it. It was online on Zoom and there were um older people, seniors, some people with disability were on there asking questions and basically saying I heard that if this happens, that there's a chance that I might go bankrupt. And then elected officials from the NDP party were like, yes, that might happen. And I was like, why are, Why would you say that these people are already like anxious, nervous, like older? Don't, don't cause fear in their lives. Like right now, nothing is happening. And if you're a good opposition party, you will ensure that they don't go bankrupt. That apparently this terrible government is not, is not, is not, you have to make sure they're not going to drag everyone down. Like you do your job so that this person doesn't have to cry on a Zoom call. And I was, I was not happy to see that kind of behavior and then it's the same thing I've seen it now it was healthcare is crisis it's collapsing the end of the world is coming and then so it, I see the same thing with this Tucker Carlson messaging she's bringing in this radical the end of the world is coming and it's every message is the same so that's the only way I understand it yeah I think that's sort of a tactic that the left has kind of you know, used uh, pretty well, unfortunately, over the past few years is that if, you know, there's some kind of alarmist issue that they can bring up, then they're going to do that and they're going to do it with full force and with full power. And I think that, you know, Tucker Carlson is kind of grouped into some of the conservatives, say if it's like Jordan Peterson, for example, he gets attacked probably the most online, probably even more than, than Pierre Polyev. Um, but seems like all of these people on the left their sole goal is just to destroy some of these people who have opposing views to them, even if, you know, their views would actually provide, you know, better outcomes for Canadians overall. It's just that they sort of attach to this ideology and then they try to make a certain group of people, you know, whether it's, you know, Pierre, Tucker uh, or Jordan, you know, they all kind of group them into this extremist right wing category and then uh, seem to kind of cause, like, as you said, like, an alarm. And then, you know, that kind of creates just more fear and creates more anxiety for people in the population. But you could also see what resonates with people. Like I just looked at how many followers Tucker Carlson has, and he has over 10 million. So clearly he's saying something that people appreciate. And I don't think it's just hate. Uh, like they're trying to suggest he's having conversations with people and having an open dialogue and one thing I have noticed too, elected officials and even some journalists kind of, they talk at you, not to you. And so yeah. I, I feel like that's a big difference too. Like he, it seems like Tucker Carlson has changed his, the way he's doing these interviews. You know, he's flying around the world meeting with presidents yeah. of different countries. Like for him to come to Alberta, take notice, you know, I yeah, think that's time. a good thing. Not a not and that's what again I don't understand with the Alberta um NDP party, the official opposition. This would, you know, if you look at it, seems to be a good idea. Like it elevates the platform and at least, you know, get some tourism out of it. I don't know. But then same with the CPP um and the APP discussion. They're so against having that happen. But if it's for the benefit of Albertans. Why are you against it? Shouldn't you be advocating for the benefit of Albertans? And so I just find it very strange. The whole um, the opposition in Alberta is is an interesting dynamic. Yeah, it's it seems like it's a very odd dynamic because Danielle, you know, from my understanding, is probably one of the more or the most conservative premier that we have in Canada right now. She seems to be you know, loved more or less by a lot of uh, Albertans right now. I think they're, they're very happy with her. Um, so like, why, like, how is it that uh, she can be so popular, but that also the NDP can be so popular? It seems like there's like an extreme there going on in that Alberta. Am I correct in saying that? Or is it? No, I, I think, and, um, you know, you, you said that Danielle Smith is the most right uh, conservative, excuse me, in Canada. But is she? What do those terms mean anymore? Except for I agree with you on the extreme part with some people. 
Um, but I think that those words that we used, like you used to understand what conservative meant and liberal meant um, and how elected officials applied it. But it's changed a lot in the last while. So I, I personally, I don't think Danielle Smith is incredibly conservative. Uh, I think she's, um, I think she's listening to what people are saying. And then when you're saying, is there a big extreme difference between two? I don't think so. Um, why you see NDP and conservative um, as the two, like the uh, party in power and the uh, official opposition. In the last election, we actually had Alberta wise, it was the lowest turnout in a while. So here things are getting heated and all this is happening. People just don't turn up to vote. I know that happened in Ontario too with the last election. So I'm turning it again back to citizens. Like if we want to have a voice, we have to start being involved in these processes. Uh, the fact that more people didn't come out to vote is crazy. I, what I think happened in Alberta is there was more of an establishment a political party and they were you know conservative because that's who the political party has been in power and she's shaken that up the established alberta part conservative party i don't think she's more extreme at all like I, she hasn't said any and that's what like the media says it all the time but tell yeah. me like ex Show me an example where she's been like, okay, well, everyone's going to church Sundays because that's the conservative way or whatever, you know? Like, they just make these suggestions, but there's no backing for most of them, is what I Yeah, and, and, and I'm just kind of guilty of that myself because I just kind of like, you know, assumed that she was, you know, more or less like the more, you know, conservative premier, but you kind of don't feel that way. And maybe there's... You know, I'm sure there's obviously big differences, but maybe there's less of a difference or in the extremes, you know, than, than I kind of suggested before. Um, you know, maybe, you know, we can kind of find some middle ground some way and maybe Danielle is someone who can do that. Do you think that, you know, she is someone who could maybe bring people together? Ultimately, yeah, I think it's going to take time. We're in such a divisive, crazy time. And I think the difference is, is, um, personal autonomy versus state intervention. And that would be what I was, would say would be the divide. So uh, with the NDP party, there, there's more state intervention. They want to, you know, jump in and, and help all the time. And whereas what I see her suggesting is more personal autonomy. And I think if we understand that personal autonomy is helpful for everyone in the end, it's not, it's not neglecting the vulnerable. It's empowering people. And I think again, if maybe the conversation shifts that way, because that's where she gets criticized. She doesn't care about, you know, the vulnerable or the seniors because she's trying to have less state intervention, which I think ultimately helps everyone in the end. Like I state think so intervention too. I think should last, be there. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. But no, as a I, last I agree person, with you hundred percent. Yeah. The, uh, the state intervention, you know, like you just said, you know, the, is the more you can keep the state out of it, I think the better for, uh, for people and also the more autonomy and freedom that they'll have. And hopefully, you know, that's something that Danielle can certainly, you know, give to back to some of the Albertans that she's, and I think she's trying to do that. And I think she's been pretty successful so far. Um, one, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say again, too, I'm always bringing it back to to Canadians and, and our Albertans because Alberta just had its largest uh, convention for a political party ever. And it was 4,000 almost members. Uh, so Albertans that made that agreed to these resolutions that were more about personal freedom. So now she's empowered by the will of 4,000 at least and more members to, to focus more on personal autonomy. So it's not just her, because I think that's also where she, you know, all these elected officials, it's easier for to counsel one person, but it's a lot harder to counsel thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people. 
Absolutely. And and I know too, I'm not sure if this is, um, you know, I've seen a couple of people put it up on Twitter. I think she made a statement. I don't know if anything's actually been implemented yet, but I've heard that she's trying to make it so that doctors can express their medical opinions online and not face repercussions from their colleges. Is that something that you've heard that she's trying to implement? So again, that was one of the resolutions at the AGM. So this was Albertans put that proposal forward and they voted on it and they said, yes, so that's going to be a direction for her party. Um, She certainly has made some suggestions about that even before she was premier, that these are um, her views. So I suspect, yes, especially given that over the weekend, that's what the members of the party voted for saying, yeah, they shouldn't be censored. Well, that's the, I think that's really excellent news, you know, not just for doctors, but for everybody. And I really mean that because I do think that, you know, misinformation, disinformation, I kind of hate those words. Yeah. You know, lies. Can, yeah. I do think that, you know, they can, it can be dangerous. But at the same time, I think that censorship is much, much, much more dangerous. And I think that if the doctors who were speaking out against COVID in the beginning uh, were felt like they could speak out more. I think that maybe we would have had better policies in place. We probably would have had less damage done. Um, What I'm talking about specifically is really with the lockdowns. We know that the lockdowns, you know, cause more harm than good. I think, you know, most people would, you know, agree with that right now. I don't think that's you know, something that's terribly controversial anymore. Um, And I think that, again, if we had this, we didn't have these censorships laws in place or, you know, censorships on doctors, then perhaps it wouldn't have been in that place uh, in the the first place. So I'm really happy to hear that Danielle is encouraging doctors to speak their mind and also removing the repercussions when they do speak their mind. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. And I not just for doctors, but anyone that's able to yeah, read an anyone. article. I remember earlier, like sharing, it was a Wall Street Journal article. I didn't write it. I read it. And it said that, um, I think it was just relating to the AstraZeneca vaccine, at least. And it said that it only, the effectiveness is only for six months. And I shared it. And people went crazy on me. They're like, why are you spreading misinformation? And then recently I reread some of the messages back. Somebody's like, it's because of you that my kids can't go to school. And I'm like, this that's a bit outrageous. I didn't write the article. This is a reputable, I think, um, journal, uh, like uh, publication. Contact yeah. them if you're you're mad. Like, why are you mad at me? Yeah, no, that's a hundred percent right. Like, if you're mad, like that, that's re- that's that's a really good point because I've had the same thing happen before. It's like you share information, and then people are like upset at the information. And it's like it's not me. This is what was objectively found in the medical study. I'm sorry that it doesn't, you know, fit your narrative, but that doesn't mean that you just get to like you know dunk on people because of that you know it makes no sense whatsoever you know we need to you know put our egos away and look at information objectively and i think you know when you uh, are you know spreading information like you said that's objective you know people you know should respond to that objectively but unfortunately um they don't they just try to they get upset because the information doesn't fit their narrative or having a conversation like let's talk about this article like adults not like children again and again i don't even know if children are this bad anymore like i don't know what's happened in the dialogue in canada and i do think it's a little bit um it's more in canada i just had the opportunity to be in in the uk a little bit and that you know knowing the united states we're just we're we're passive aggressive and i think at the same time too we don't stand up for ourselves and i think we've come we hit this and we didn't know how to react so people then just like i think we were terrible with the shame and blame culture cancel culture more than anywhere else because um we didn't know how to stand up for ourselves i think um yeah. earlier and it's it was just very sad like we're supposed to be inclusive and and diverse and we're the opposite of that in canada 
Yeah. And I, I think too, that virtue signaling was sort of encouraged, you know, like Canadians have always kind of been known as nice people. The Americans are, you know, Canadians are not like Americans kind of thing, you know, and I don't know why Canadians like to make that distinction. Like whenever I go away and meet Americans, I always find them to be friendly people for the most part. Yeah. But, you know, Canadians, for whatever reason, we always want everyone to think that we're the nicest people, you know, and that we're nicer than Americans in particular for, again, really odd reasons. Um, and I think that just got perpetuated and perpetuated through the media. And now you look at social media and, you know, people are basically just trying to virtue signal in their Twitter bio. You know, half the people in Canada, their Twitter bio is going to be like vaxxed, boosted, he, him, like, you know, just BLM, whatever it is, like it just keeps going on and going on instead of just, you know, saying who they are or what they represent. And it's fine to, you know, have those things in your bio, but you should have it there for a specific reason. And you should also shouldn't be, you know, shaming other people, like you said, like a lot of these people who, you know, virtue signal about being vaccinated, for example, then they would shame other people who say we're not vaccinated. And, you know, that's something that I don't think is a nice or an empathetic thing to do yet. It's something that was perpetuated uh, throughout social media, throughout the pandemic. And there was a lot of people who were, you know, virtue signaling. Yeah, well, and I think that goes to the, a broad discussion. I'm not no psychologist, but I think that this is where people lack identity and community. Personally, I've always had a hard time with any labels, um, even when people say, I'm a lawyer, I'm like, well, that's what I do. <laughs> and I'm not always a lawyer. Um, but I, I'm comfortable with Eva, Eva Chippy, yeah. you know, anything more is like, I don't need that to define who I am. So I find that uh, psychology very interesting, where you have to uh, take on that ownership of uh, like the Ukrainian flag my dad's from Ukraine and we have family all over Poland. Like it, it was super concerning, but what does that mean? I'm not just going to all of a sudden show my heritage. I never have been, I never had a Ukrainian flag before. Why would I start now? Did I not care about the country before? And I only started caring about it now. So to me, that's always been a bit strange but that's that's always been me like like i said that's always, it's 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 strange how you, you know you use the word like care just because like that's what people shame with like oh like you don't care about other people you're not going to wear a mask because you don't care about others you're not going to get vaccinated because you don't care about others it's like that's ridiculous and it's really rude and like you think that you're being empathetic by saying this but actually you're being the complete opposite you're dividing the country and you're probably you know don't know some of the information that you should know and you probably would have a very different opinion if you did have all the information yeah and i was confronted with this a while ago too um that shame thing just for just the color of my skin and my mom grew up in communist poland my dad here under like both farmers like just because my skin is white doesn't mean i came from privilege and then i became a lawyer as a lawyer, I represented landowners, like vulnerable people against mammoth companies and government. So with my job, I never took the like I never took the the big money jobs that cut, could maybe oppress or suppress people. I'm not even saying that they deserve representation, too. Then I opened up a business, a woman um, opening up a health and wellness business. Too. It's not it. like I'm like there to like steal your money. I was trying to help people. And I was like, and I, I was trying to have a conversation with this person and they weren't seeing any of it. I'm like, you can't just say something and think that that's true. You have to understand the context for, for you to say I'm privileged. Maybe if I was running around and not doing anything like any of the things I've been doing. But you can't say that given my background, like you have to put that into the equation. And it was just the weirdest conversation for me. And I'm still not over it. I'm still trying to figure out how people have that psychology. Yeah, that's 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 super odd. And I know I wasn't going to ask about this today, but just because you brought it up. So what is your, your business exactly? Can you just tell us a little bit more about it? 
Well, so that one I don't have, but I'll tell you about my new one. So I, I did in Edmonton own a yoga studio and a health and wellness type um, food um, restaurant because I wanted to, you know, people to be healthy in body and mind. And I thought that was so important and it was important for me. So I wanted to help people um, access that. But uh, I owned the yoga studio and cafe less than two years and then COVID came and the most stringent restrictions were on health facilities or like fitness facilities, which makes absolutely no sense. So that was when I was, or I, I immediately was like, something's wrong here. My yoga studio is closed, but the liquor store is open. That's next door. Or the convenience store is open with cigarettes for a respiratory pandemic, but the yoga studio is closed. Hmm strange so that was and so i i had to walk away it just didn't make any sense the mandates were crazy and and also i could tell psychologically it would take a long time for people to come back a yoga studio you want to like huddle in as many people into a room as possible um because it's not like a gym they can't come and go they're there for uh, the time period and the more people the better um and I just knew that they wouldn't be comfortable for a while being close to some people, of course, would, but the vast majority, it would take a while. So yeah. I, I walked away. And then now I've started a new endeavor called Empowered Canadians, again, trying to help elevate people and help people. But this with understanding their legal uh, rights and processes and political systems, because that's what I've learned being a little bit in the spotlight now is people are confused and they don't know how to get involved. So I'm trying to elevate the conversation. So we're not hopefully in this position again. Well, I think that's amazing that you're doing that, you know, trying to empower other Canadians. It seems like you're always trying to just do the best thing, the right thing for people. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's fantastic to know that there's other, you know, people out there that are trying to help others. And I think, you know, that just kind of gives people a, a good kind of sense of well-being. You know, we always hear about so much destruction and, you know, death, you know, in the news and so, uh, you know, and people always talk about the world ending and stuff like that. And so it's just good to hear that, you know, there's still good people out there in the world who are still trying to do good things. And we definitely need more people like you. So I appreciate you, uh, you, you know, starting that, that business. I'm definitely going to check it out online. I know I've seen a couple of tweets about it, so I'll, I'll check it out more for, for sure. Um, so one thing that I did want to ask you about, speaking about your your Twitter account, because uh, I, I found it on your Twitter. So there was like $173 million were put into a vaccine facility. Was it in, in Quebec? And I think that um, no vaccines were ever produced. So what happened to that money? Government contracts. What are you asking? This is typical. No, I'm kidding. And to be honest, I don't know oh, too much about it. I kind of uh, retweeted that one. I think I just did. But that came up, I think, two years ago or so. They were making a big deal about this um, lab, millions of dollars going into it. And then, yeah, they've closed their doors um, in less than two years with nothing being produced out of it. So, and again, I know you said you're you're not a complete expert on this particular uh, subject or, or this event, but is it possible then that like basically 173 million dollars were just wasted? Yes, and what it's it's not just 160 million dollars. Is there's in the last two weeks we've heard arrive can um, how much is lost. Um, it's on every department, and it's. Bonkers. And this is where, again, I'm saying Canadians need to really start asking questions about what the hell is going on. And the Arrive Can app is like 50 something million or something. 54 like million that. dollars. And one company that got 11 million dollars has two employees. It, wouldn't that be nice to have 11 million dollars <laughs> and, and two employees? To boot. He does, that company didn't do any of the programming. They don't, that's not their, like what they do. What they were doing is connecting people. 
Okay, so we gave eleven million dollars to two people to connect people to use the ArriveCan app. Well, no, to like make it, you know. So the government wow. wanted to do this. Okay, now we need people to create the software and the app. So eleven million dollars for that, apparently. Great job. And it, and it seems like it was basically all wasted. We can't really count for any of that money whatsoever. Yeah, well, this is where we, again, I'm putting it back on Canadians. We're letting this happen. We are um, letting it happen. I agree. Yeah, we just need to start asking questions. Like, if you see an article, a National Post or whatever, with this information, you could forward it to your elected official and be like, wow, what is going on? Can you please help me understand where the money went and what you're doing to address this? Because I'm not happy with this as your constituent. And I think that we're not doing that. So, I, Yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. One area where I think that some people are being vocal, but we're clearly, clearly still not being vocal enough is the carbon tax. Because mm -hmm. I know that that's just absolutely killing some people and i know that pierre polyev really wants to get rid of it or so he says he does so you know why do we have this carbon tax and what can we do to try to get rid of it other than get pierre polyev elected yeah right to your elected officials and i think that's such an easy and good one why are you giving a rebate to one part of the country and not the other part it's not based on income so there's people in alberta with less income than the people in Newfoundland, and they have to pay the carbon tax. It's the most ridiculous uh, policy. And this one is an easy one for people to contact their elected officials on and, and show the hypocrisy. Be like, look, I'm barely managing in Manitoba, and you want to tax me more for this? How am I supposed to heat my home? But is anybody doing that? I don't, I don't know. I know I had Aaron gone on here maybe a month or two ago. I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with, yeah. with Aaron or not. Yeah. So um, Aaron was talking about this a little bit and he was also, he had an article, I think recently or a video where he was talking about the carbon tax and then uh, the issue with natural gas and that like it is going to affect people differently across Canada. Um, like the Atlantic provinces and Ontario, we're going to be affected differently than the rest of Canada. Um, is that something you're familiar with or, or, or could speak about? Uh, not specifically, no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I forget exactly what, what Aaron was, was saying, but it was something to do with carbon tax. And, you know, if you had natural gas, um, there was, and, and if versus if you didn't have natural gas, so, you know, it wasn't necessarily going to affect all Canadians um, equally, it was going to affect them disproportionately based upon what they were using or whether or not they were using natural gas. So it just seemed to be like a, a play that was put into place that, you know, uh, was the message was it was going to affect everybody equally. But if you look at it, it seems like people are not affected equally well, overall. Like everyone needs to heat them their home. So yeah. why should it matter which one? And maybe it's because one emission is higher than the other, but still what are people supposed to do this winter like they're not going to yeah. go out and change their whole heating system so it is very like again this the this policy and all the stuff around it is there's so much room to get in you know at, in engaged with your elected officials about and demand some answers um so yeah. I, I i'm i think it's on canadians to do that yeah, I, th I think it's on, on Canadians too. And even myself, like I've admitted it before, like before three or four years ago, I didn't follow politics too, too much. Like I, I and the reason was, is because I kind of just figured maybe a little bit naively, but, and maybe wrongly so that like, you know, it doesn't really affect me that much. Like what I, whoever gets elected, like my, I'm just going to wake up the next day, go to work and hang out with my friends and everything's going to be the same, you know? Um, but now things are different and, you know, clearly who you elect is going to affect your life. And because they are making decisions that affect my life, such as lockdowns and different policies, vaccine mandates, lots of different things. So, um, yeah, Canadians do need to get more, more involved. Yeah. And it affects every aspect of our life, like for roads, sewers municipally like it does affect us we just 
It does. It does. You know, I, I understand it. that yeah. now. Yeah. Um, one thing that I wanted to, to ask you about, Eva, uh, I don't, I don't I didn't see this recently on your Twitter, but I was just wondering if you knew anything about the ARC conference. You just kind of seem like a person who would, you know, be involved with this and, and would be an asset to it. So I was just wondering if you had any involvement with the ARC conference. Is it something that you are maybe want to go to next year or... Yeah, well, maybe if they hear it, um, I, I would have been happy to be involved <laughs> in it. Um, I, I wasn't invited. I, I wasn't there. I did hear about it um, a little bit, um, but I, I don't know exactly everything about it. So it'd be interesting to see what they come up with. Okay. Yeah, well, one of my uh, pretty good friends there, Rav Aurora, and mm -hmm. uh, he's probably going to try and I think he's going to get me to go um, next year. I think I can say that non confidentially. We'll see. And so I'd like to, I'd like to next go year for is sure. It's a long time away. So <laughs> it is, it is, but maybe you'll be there too. It'd be, it'd be great. I think, you know, they need more people like yourself there just because, you know, for people who, who are not uh, aware of what the ARC conference is or, or was, it just happened, I think a week or two ago in, in London, uh, England. And essentially, you know, what they're trying to promote it is as something that's, um, you know, an antithesis or something that's opposing to the WEF, you know. And so uh, Jordan Peterson, I think, was probably the head of that or seemed to be anyway. And he has a lot of people, you know, uh, involved. I'm sure that you would be very familiar with like Doug Murray and a bunch of other people like that who, um, you know, I guess are very concerned about the state of the world and WEF and they want to do something so that, there's people who are, you know, reasonably conservative or, you know, just in the middle overall um, on the on the spectrum. And uh, unfortunately, you know, we don't have too many of those people in power right now. And maybe with the Air Conference, we can, you know, generate more um, more content and just more um, exposure. And then people will be able to see, you know, that there is there are other avenues that we can go down, and there are people who are, you know. Uh, who have a center right or a center view uh, with reasonable views. And uh, hopefully that happens at the art conference, but um, we'll see what happens. Yeah. And, and I'm with you. It seems very interesting. I am a very action oriented person and that's why um, with empowered Canadians, it's uh, I've actually developed a civics course where, you know, people learn about the history of Canada, um, what the charter is, because I think we've talked a lot about the charter in the last two years. I think many haven't read it or read any of the decisions that came from the charter uh, cases, um, how the government is structured, the legal system is structured, and then the importance of civic engagement. Because there's so much, again, we can do, like as Canadians, as individuals, working together. Um, a term that I recently learned, relearned, in this book called The Canadian Politics, uh, it was from like Politics 101 that I found lurking around. And right in the first few chapter, first chapter, first few pages, it talked about pressure groups. And a pressure group is just like moms coming together and affecting change. Like the whole um, MAD program in the United States, drunk against drunk driving, that was mothers came together yeah. because some sons were killed or I don't know the whole backstory, but that was a pressure group. And then they worked on the on the government. We don't have to just wait. That's a good example. Very good yeah. example. And it doesn't have to be like big pharma, the only one talking to. They're just more effective. And yeah, they have more money, but that doesn't mean we can't be effective. Like, look at the convoy. It, it was yeah. able to raise $10 million twice. I'm not saying that's going to happen again overnight, but... We have to be a bit smarter and more strategic as Canadians too. Yeah, I, I think you're right. We do need to be strategic. And, you know, the Freedom Convoy was amazing and, you know, grateful for Tamara Lynch and what she's doing. I wish her all the best in, in her court case and all that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, I think that as, as Canadians, we, sh we do need to come together and look at other groups, like you said, like Mad Mothers Against Drunk Driving. It was just a bunch of mothers who are sick and tired of you know, uh, of, of people getting killed by drunk drivers and it developed into this incredible organization. And, you know, there, there will be other organizations that develop in the future. We know that. So, you know, there is, there is hope, there is 
change that people can make. And, you know, if you want to make the change, you just have to kind of work at it, be strategic, talk to the right people, work hard and, and get it done. Um, I know we only have uh, a few minutes there left, Eva, and I did want to uh, ask you a couple more questions, particularly about this uh, petition that came up with Leslin Lewis. So um, I think I've seen it on her Twitter a couple of times. So it's basically a petition that she doesn't want Canadians or Canada to be involved with the UN and the WHO. Is that correct? Yeah. And so just one thing to clarify is I, I'm just learning about these things on Twitter too. Just like everyone else, I have no inside knowledge or scoops to like ARC or uh, Leslin Lewis or anybody. And I saw it going around. I read it. It makes sense. I can't even believe that this is something we have to debate, but it's something that needs to be addressed and it's raising awareness about it and then talking about solutions, hopefully. So yeah, it's a petition that is through the House of Commons put forward by an MP that shows that there's a lot of interference from international organizations like the WHO into Canadian governance and say, and the petition calls to end those relationships. And I think it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And, and you think that it would be a better outcome for Canadians if we didn't have the influence of those organizations. Is that correct? Well, what are what is the influence? It's so not transparent. We don't know what's going on. We don't elect these people. Um, like the head of the WHO is a veterinarian. Like talk about you're not able to you're not able to provide medical information or me reading an article. We've got a veterinarian that's in charge of the WHO for the whole country for the whole world. Um and how did he get to that position? And what is his job and role, really? Like, is he there to just... Prov it's one thing for the uh, an or international organization like that to provide recommendations or suggestions for countries, but it's another thing to dictate policy. And I think that's where we're at. And they're telling, they're demanding countries to do it. And that's not democracy. So it's very strange. It it is odd that like these other um, these other organizations who we didn't elect in Canada get to tell Canadians what to do, like it's just sort of odd. Like I understand you know looking for you know respected sources on certain things and you know uh, reaching out to people who may have more you know knowledge on us and using that information, but the whole thing is a little bit odd because these people were not elected by Canadians and yet we are taking their advice and using that advice with Canadians, which doesn't really make sense. It's not what we voted for. We didn't vote for anyone in the UN. We didn't vote for anyone in the WHO, yet their policies are still being implemented in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. So it, I, I, I don't, I think we need way more clarity, way more transparency around it if we want to have a relationship yeah. with anybody like that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Like it's not, again, I'm not, completely against us, you know, potentially having a relationship, you know, with these people. I think that that's something that, you know, that may be beneficial overall, but like potentially, I'm not saying it is for sure, but it needs to be, like you said, significantly more transparent. Like how is this specifically benefiting Canadians or are we just blindly taking these policies and applying them without really looking at them stringently and making sure that they are, you know, associate with better outcomes overall. Um, on that note, Eva, uh, our hour is, is basically up right now, but uh, it's been amazing chatting with you. I really enjoyed our, our conversation. Um, can you tell people where they can find you online, what your Twitter handle is and all that kind of stuff? Sure. Just to embarrass myself, my Twitter handle or X is for Eva Eva 79. I did not think I'd be doing this professionally when I started a, an account, but now I think it helps with how to pronounce my name. So I'm okay with it. And uh, I encourage people to go there. I'm quite active there the most. And then empoweredcanadians.ca would be where you find information about um, how to get yourself uh, more, give yourself more knowledge and empower yourself to be an active member in this crazy democracy and this hard work we have to put in to be, to have a strong, healthy democracy in Canada. And that's also on Twitter and all social media. So that's where you'll find me. Thanks so much for having me.
Well, that's an amazing place to end it. Thank you so much for providing that information. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. I really do appreciate it. And as always, I'll be back again with another episode next week.